Hello and welcome to session 4 of UGBS 208. Now today we're going to take a look at company accounts. Now basically we would try and explain and discuss the nature of limited liability companies. Although there are other forms of companies which we would just mention briefly. Then we will try and explain the differences between the various classes of shares. Then we will learn how to account for the issuance of shares in Ghana. We will try and explain the purpose and prepare an income surplus account as well as an income statement and a statement of financial position for a limited liability companies. Okay. Now, now the Companies Act 1963 Act 179 is the law which governs the formation and operations of companies in Ghana. Now, the Act defines a company as anybody corporate which is formed or registered under the, the Act. By a body corporate, the law seeks to define that any corporation which is formed under the Act or otherwise, and whether in Ghana or elsewhere, is deemed to be a duly recognized company. Now, as you are aware from our previous discussion on the partnership accounts, we said you cannot have an association of partnership consisting of more than 20 persons, although we did hint that there could be exceptions. But under normal circumstances, whenever we have more than 20 individuals coming together to operate a business, that organization ought to be registered as a company. Now, companies have some characteristics which I'm aware we have discussed in the previous session when we're trying to state the distinction between partnerships and companies. Now, just to highlight a few of them, you should know that companies are separate legal entities. So you usually hear that companies can be sued and they can sue. We recognize companies as beings, just that they are artificial beings. Then there's a distinction between management and ownership. It could be limited liability. Usually companies would have perpetual succession. So you, you, would, you would see some very old companies still existing today. Over 100 years companies in our world today. That is because one key characteristic of companies are that they have perpetual succession. Then you could also have transferability of interest. Transferability of interest. Meaning individuals who have interest in that organization could easily transfer that interest. Okay. In terms of formation of the company of companies, Section 80 provides some requirements which would apply to private companies and as well as public companies. We would go ahead and show the distinction between private and public companies later on. But to start with, you must know that a private company is restricted to the number of individuals or members who have interest in that organization. It cannot go beyond 50. Now, the Act requires that for the formation of a company, an organization should comply with the all the provisions in the Act and they should satisfy the Registrar General. Now, the Certificate of Incorporation is issued to the promoters after they have met the minimum capital requirement after which the company can only begin trading when they have received their certificate of commencement of business. The company would have its own regulations which would contain the name of the company, the nature of business, its status, the name of its first directors, its powers and some other provisions which would be required. Okay. Now, companies could either be limited by shares, guarantees or they may be unlimited. When we say a company is limited by shares, then we want to mean that the liability of the members of that particular company is limited only to the amount, if any, for an unpaid portion of the shares which they have acquired. If they have paid all the amounts on the shares held by them, then their liability is restricted only to the amount that they have advance to acquire an interest in the organization. Meaning in the event of winding up, if the company is unable to get enough resources or enough cash from its assets 
to settle its liabilities, the individual properties of members cannot be touched to defray the cost. Okay. But companies could also be limited by a guarantee. Now, that is where liabilities of their members is limited to the amount that they promise or they undertake to contribute to the assets of the company in the event of winding up. And you would usually see that for some non-governmental organizations, they may be registered as companies which are limited by guarantee. You could also have unlimited liability companies, where the liability of its members is not limited, meaning the individual assets of members can be touched in the event of winding up and when the company requires enough resources to settle its liabilities. We could also further classify companies as either private or public ones. The distinction is that private companies have some restrictions when it comes to transfer of their shares, as well as making invitation to the public. They are prohibited from inviting the public to acquire shares or debenture. Now, usually, the debenture or shares of the organization is restricted to a number, which is 50. However, public companies may not have any restrictions. They can issue shares up to the amount authorized by their company's regulation. For that matter, the Act in Section 9 states clearly that any other company aside what has been described as a private company may be deemed as a public company. Section 123 to 136 of the Companies Act provides the various accounting and audit requirements as you would usually see for organizations that operate as companies in this country. Now, you should be aware that the reason why there are lots of requirements for these organizations are that the interest of members could be dispersed. You could have so many people having an interest in one organization. And for that matter, because there's a separation between ownership and management, controlling management could be a bit difficult when we have, we, we have so many people um, being members. For that matter, there should be some requirements which would protect the interest of members within the organization. Okay. Let's try to understand how one can acquire interest in an organization or how one could be a shareholder. Now, an individual has interest in a company only when the person has acquired shares. For an organization or a company that is limited by shares. Now, a share represents the interest of members of that body corporate, and that those members would be entitled to share in any capital and income of such body corporate. Now, the level of interest in a company is determined by the number of shares held by a particular member and not by the amount of money paid to acquire the shares. So you should note that someone could acquire lots of shares at a certain point in time at a very low cost and the person could have much more interest in the company than another person who just acquired the shares of the organization at a very high price. Okay. The basis for determining the level or proportion of interest is not the amount paid for the share, but rather the number of shares held by the member. In Ghana, the Section 40 of the Act states clearly that shares have no power value. For that matter, in accounting for shares within our jurisdiction, there will neither be issues with shares acquired at a premium or shares acquired at a discount. That is because we do not have a fixed amount or a price attached to a share upon its creation. Hence, the prices of shares at a point in time would be used in dealing in that particular shares of a particular company. There are basically two types of shares, which represents the level of interest that members may have 
in a company. Shares could either be termed as preferred or ordinary. Now, the distinction between these two types of shares is that preference shares are always given the preference or could say they are given priority when it comes to payment of dividends or when it comes to distribution of capital in the event of winding up. However, they do not have the right to participate in any other income beyond the amount which has been promised them or beyond the amount which is given them upon distribution. However, ordinary shareholders are deemed the true risk takers. Hence, they are not entitled to a fixed amount of dividend, but they only receive their dividends if it has been declared by directors and preference shareholders have already been paid. However, they are entitled to any residual capital or income from the company. They also have unrestricted voting rights since basically they bear the residual risk of the company. Okay. So how are shares issued in this country? Now, as we have mentioned earlier, shares of a company can be issued up to the total number authorized by the company's own regulations. Now, Section 42 states once again clearly that shares shall only be issued for valuable consideration and paid for in cash or otherwise as agreed. Hence, shares cannot be issued to individuals or members for free. Whenever shares are issued, there should be valuable consideration. There are so many ways by which an organization could issue its shares. Shares could be issued either through an initial public offer, where we have sale of shares by company for the first time to the public. It would invite the public to acquire sh uh, shares of that particular company. Now, shares could also be issued through private placement, where shares are sold to private investors without the use of public markets or exchanges. Now, you could also have capitalization issue, otherwise known as bonus or script issue. In a situation where the organization has made so much profit and it has so much money in its reserves, however, it would want to convert some of these reserves into capital. It could distribute to shareholders in, as new shares in proportion to their existing shareholding and pay for that distribution using its reserves. And that is what we refer to as capitalization issue or bonus issue. Now, some will refer to it as instead of paying dividends to shareholders, companies can decide to issue shares to existing shareholders and pay for the share with the reserves of the organization. Okay. Now, there's also a right issue where shares are issued to existing shareholders in proportion to their current shareholding by respecting their preemption rights. But usually, these shares are given to the existing shareholders at a lower price. However, it is not mandatory for existing shareholders to purchase these shares. They may decide to waive their right. And once they waive this right, the public or other individuals could be invited to acquire the shares. Let's now concentrate on the procedure for issuing shares in Ghana. We are going to go through some quick steps. And I would advise that you take your time to understand every step because the steps will be quite useful to us when we begin to account for issuance of shares within the organization. Now, first of all, an organization that seeks to issue shares to the public would first make an invitation to the public to apply for the shares. If you studied some commercial law, you should know there's a big difference between an invitation and an offer. The company inviting the public does not constitute an offer. Rather, an invitation has been given to the public to apply. Hence, the public will make an offer to the company, which the company will then decide to either accept or reject. Usually, 
this invitation is made through the mass media, you would find the prospectors of the company, there will be advertisement, and there will be other conditions attached to the offer. It is expected that as members or prospective members apply for the shares, they may pay amounts related to the number of shares that they want to apply for. Now, after the invitation has been made, an application has been received from the public accompanied by the cash, stating clearly the number of shares that they want to apply for. The company would then go ahead to either accept or reject the offer made by the public. And that is what we refer to as allotment of shares. So the process of allocating shares to applicants or acceptance of the offer, rejection of the offer, or partial acceptance is what we refer to as allotment of shares. Now, you should note at this stage that when individuals apply to be members or apply to acquire shares, the company reserves the right to either accept, reject, or accept in part what individuals applied for. When individuals have been successful and shares have been allotted to them, it is at this stage that we could call them shareholders of the company. Now, if the entire amount of the share was not paid upon application, then at a certain later date, which may be agreed by the company, a call could be made to ask all the shareholders to pay up all the unpaid amount on the share price. And that is what we refer to as the calls for arrears on share values. Now, at any stage of this process, individuals who have been allotted shares and have become shareholders may not be able to pay up the calls money. In that instance, the directors of a company may meet to decide on the fate of such individuals. Now, if the shares of an individual is forfeited, then the shares would be returned to the company and will be kept as treasury shares, which will be issued later on to other prospective members of the company. As we mentioned, treasury shares could either come up through forfeiture of shares by a member who couldn't pay the amount on his call, or if the company itself redeems a portion of the shares, or the company acquires or purchases its own shares. Now, the Act states that any issue of shares while there are shares in Treasury is, be, is deemed to be an issue of Treasury shares before any fresh issue. Hence, any company that has shares in Treasury must issue the Treasury shares first before it will go ahead to issue other shares for the company. Okay. Now, in getting to how we can account for shares, it is important that we become aware of an important account known as the share dues account. Now, this account usually is used in recording transactions which involves the issue of treasury shares. Now, the account is used in order to help prevent the company's stated capital from fluctuating or reducing at any point in time when the company decides to deal in its own shares which we have, we have recognized as the treasury shares. The components of our owner's equity. If you would recall, in our discussion of accounting equation, we did take our time to explain the full components of owner's equity or shareholder's equity. It is not different from what we are going to see under company accounts. Because paid up capital is kept in the stated capital, then the stated capital becomes an important component of owner's equi equity, representing the interest of members within the organization. The share deals account, which is used in accounting for the shares that the company has been dealing in, would also be a component of the owner's equity. Then the income surplus account, which is the reserve for profits 
and from which all distributions are made to members by way of dividend. It's also an important component of owner's equity. Then our capital surplus account, which is usually a reserve from revaluation of non-current assets within the organization. As we mentioned, dividends or distributions could be made from the company's reserves, i.e. The income, the income surplus account to members. Now, a company can only pay dividends to shareholders if after such payment, the company will still be able to pay its debts that are due it. And the amount of any dividend payment shall not exceed the income surplus account of the company prior to the payment. Now, dividend payment could either be in cash or non-cash. Could you think of dividend payment which is non-cash? Well, think about it. And you could discuss more of issues like this on our Sakai platform. Let's now take our time to go through how we could account for shares which are being issued. Shares could either be issued and the payment for these shares could either be in installment or the entire amount could be paid upon application. If the payment is an installment, then it will be critical for you to go back to the steps and the process that we need to go through when issuing shares. First, remember, there is an invitation to the public. Two, the public would apply by making offer to the company then the company would either accept or reject the offer by way of allotment of shares. Then there could be calls for the unpaid portions or the unpaid amounts on the shares. If there are any issues with forfeiture of shares arising out of an individual member not being able to make pay up the cost money, then we would also look at how we can account for them. Okay. The accounting entries as follows at the application stage when cash or check is received upon application the company will debit its bank or cash account and credit the application account with all the amounts of cash received upon application however if consideration other than cash is received then the relevant asset account will be debited and the application account will be credited with the agreed value of the consideration received on application. If upon application stage, there is rejection of some applications by the company, and for that matter, amounts would have to be refunded to the various applicants, then a reverse of the entry that we made would be passed in the books by debiting the application account and crediting the bank or cash account with the amount received in the application which have been rejected. However, when we are done with the application stage, it is possible that there were some applicants whose application were accepted in part. And for that matter, their refund would still be with the organization. I the entire number of shares and the amount they, they paid for upon application were not allotted to them. But because they were partially successful, the company can decide to retain a, their excess applications money until a future date, so as to be used in paying for subsequent transactions that would be required for the payment of the shares. If there is none, then the amount which will be left in our application account will then be transferred to the stated capital account by debiting application accounts and crediting stated capital account. But if there are excess applications money for partially successful applicants, then these amounts from time to time will be transferred to the next stage. Upon allotment, all monies which were retained as excess funds on applications to be used in subsequent transactions for partially successful applicants will be transferred from the application account to the allotment account 
by debiting the application account and crediting the allotment account with the amount received in respect of rejected portions for partially successful applicants. However, if these amounts are not enough to pay up for the entire amounts expected on allotment, then the applicants will be expected to make some additional payments to cover up for the entire amount. Hence, on receipt of allotment monies, debit your bank or cash account and credit your allotment account. At the end, the entire amount which we have in our allotment account will then be transferred to form a part of our stated capital. Now, this will end our allotment stage. The next stage, which will be the call stage. Now, when the firm or the organization calls on its members to pay up any arrears on the share price, all amounts which are received will be debited to the bank account and credited to the call account. Then, transfer from the call account will be made to the stated capital account by debiting the call account and crediting the stated capital account. If at this stage, there is still any excess applications money available, then the excess money would have to be refunded to the individual applicants by debiting your application account and crediting bank account. Now, this tells us that at any stage from allotment to call, if there are excess applications money, we would continue to release the excess applications money, remember, for only the partially successful applicants at every stage to pay up for the amount we are expecting from them at a given stage for the issuance of shares. Now, this should normally conclude the process for accounting for shares which have been issued in installment. However, in situations where individuals or members fail to pay up course money and their shares have been forfeited, the shares may be reissued at a later date. Upon forfeiture of the shares, no entry is made in the books. But when the shares are reissued, amounts received from the reissue will be debited to the cash account and credited to the share dues account. Remember, the share dues account comes in here because upon forfeiture of the shares, the shares became treasury shares and they now belong to the organization. Now, when the company decides to deal in its own shares, then the account which will be used in recording that transaction will be the share dues account. Okay. At any point in time, when the organization engages in a bonus issue of shares, it is simply going to be a transfer from the company's reserves to the state capital account. Hence, you will debit your income surplus and credit the state capital account with the amount which is supposed to be used in paying for the shares being given out as a bonus issue. Okay. Although we've gone through this lengthy process, it is quite interesting to note that in our environment, shares are usually issued and paid for upon application. If that is the situation, then the process becomes quite shorter, as we usually observe in our environment in this country. So if we are going to pay for the entire amount of the share all at once, then we are going to account for it only at the application stage because the entire share price will be paid upon application. Successful applicants will become shareholders and unsuccessful applicants would have a refund of the entire amounts they paid upon application. For this matter, the accounting entries are as follows. All monies receipts on application will be debited to the bank or cash account, then credited to our application account. Then, for rejected applicants, would have to reverse the entry by debiting applications account and crediting the cash account or bank account with the amount refunded to rejected applicants. Now, when this is done, any amount which is left sitting in our application account then would be transferred to the stated capital account. 
And this will end the process for issuing shares where the entire price of the share is paid for upon application. Now, once again, in a situation where treasury shares are issued, the accounting entries are quite similar to what we have this already discussed. Just that the account we are going to use in here will be the share dues account. So all amounts received will be debited to the cash or bank account and credited to the share dues account. Okay. At this stage, refer to assignment four and try your hands on question one. Company accounts are confirmed limited. Now, take your time, go through the steps that I've taken you through when it comes to issuance of shares and payment for these shares and installments. Now, when you do have a very good understanding of the process, you should be able to handle this assignment quite easily. I do believe you've taken your time to go through question one for assignment four. If you have done that successfully, then you can now go ahead to add some more information to increase your knowledge in company accounts. We have dealt with issuance of shares and all issues regarding acquisition and accounting for these shares. Let's now consider the financial statements of a company and how these financial statements are prepared or presented. The typical financial statement of a company would include the income statement, which would show you the results of the company's operation, the results of its business. So the profit and loss will be reported in the income statement. Then our income surplus account, our reserve, which ought to be keeping our profit, otherwise known as the retained earnings account. Remember, it is from this account that you can make distributions to members, meaning dividends are paid from our income surplus account. Then our statement of financial position, as well as our statement of cash flow, and additional notes to the financial statements. Okay. A typical income statement for a company, for one, has been presented to you. Now, preparing the income statement is not so different from the income statement we have already prepared for different types of organizations. Just that. Depending on the type of business in which the company engages in, the presentation could be different. The income statement for a bank could appear quite different from the income statement of a manufacturing business. And that of a service organization could also be different. However, depending on whether the accounts are expected to be published to the public, the presentation could also be different. It could be condensed where you may have to refer to the notes to have a very good understanding of the individual items presented on the face of the account. Okay. A typical income surplus account is what we have shown to you. The only adjustments which we would make in this account would be that whatever balance we had at the beginning, any profit we made from the income statement would be shown by adding then when we need to make distributions from the income surplus account we deduct to arrive at the closing balance then alas our statement of financial position is not too different from what we have already discussed in our previous sessions now this brings us to the end of company accounts and i do hope you have a very good understanding now, to help you in the preparation of the final accounts for your company, just take a look at question three in assignment four, company accounts, Yewo Chrome Company Limited. Now, go through the various steps, make good use of the knowledge you have acquired so far, and learn how to prepare the income statement, the income surplus account, and the statement of financial position for a company. Thank you, and see you sometime later.